So it's a pleasure to introduce myself. I've been here for 33 years, and I'm still here. So is post-transition fertility too low population aging and transfer systems? Um, this topic is of uh, sort of prominent concern. Um, population aging is occurring most places around the world, and where it isn't occurring now, it's going to be occurring soon. And all countries have some sorts of systems for realloc reallocating resources from working age people to children and to the elderly. And population aging puts severe pressures on such systems in many countries, particularly in rich industrial countries, as we'll be seeing. Um, now, population aging, as, as I look at it, is mainly due to low fertility, although it's also partly due to um, longer life. And in the U.S., we're about to have a period of very rapid population aging over the next 25 years or so <clears throat> as the baby boom generation moves into old age. But population aging in the U.S. isn't due to the baby boom. It's due to the baby bust. It's due to the rapid decline in fertility in the 1960s and 1970s and the low, relatively low fertility in historical context that we've had since then. And so if population aging in the U.S. is uh, due to the baby bust, uh, at least in part, does that mean that um, we would be better off with higher fertility? But that's the kind of question I will be talking about. And of course the U.S. is sort of towards the high end of fertility for uh, rich industrial countries. Europe is much lower. Um, at this point, well, Taiwan has a total fertility rate of 0.9. 42% um, of the world pop population is living in countries with below replacement fertility, according to the United Nations. Um, and that number, I think, is continuing to grow, uh, that, that proportion. Um, and so the question here is whether fertility has fallen too low in some sense in these countries and whether we might be better off if it was a little bit higher. Of the many countries in the world that uh, responded to a United Nations survey uh, on their views on population, 56 countries uh, view their fertility as too high. Uh, not so surprising, but there are 51 countries that view their fertility as too low. And many of these 51 countries have explicit population policies in place to try to raise fertility. So that's the setting for this uh, question. Now I'm going to be drawing, this, this paper is uh, joint with Andy Mason and together we direct the National Transfer Accounts Project, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. But that project, among other things, estimates age profiles of labor income and of consumption. And it also estimates uh, private sort of familial transfers to children and the elderly. Uh, and it estimates public transfers. And so we'll be drawing on those uh, data in this investigation. Uh, I want to mention the important limitation that we will be taking the currently existing systems of transfers of, of support for dependent ages. These currently existing systems we will be taking as given and held fixed uh, into the future. Now, the reality is that these systems are going to be changing. Certainly in poor third world countries, uh, many of these countries will be moving towards 
something more like a European welfare state, uh, as Latin America has already done, while well, they're still quite poor, and as Japan uh, did as it transitioned from a, a poor third world country to a leading rich industrial country, they also adopted pretty much wholesale uh, the machinery of a European welfare state. So there are going to be big changes in the uh, developing world, but there are also going to be big changes, I expect, in the rich industrial countries. Um, I'm sure we're going to be working longer and retiring later. I'm sure pension benefits are going to be cut in one way or another. And on the healthcare side, it's harder to say since there's so much momentum towards raising expenditures per, uh, per person covered by these public health care programs. But uh, I'm sure that there will be reductions, at least relative to that long-term trend in the future. So uh, what I'm going to be doing, what Andy and I have done, is limited in this way. Uh, but at, at the same time, the fact that we're drawing on a wide range of different countries and different kinds of support systems, as we'll see in a moment, uh, gives it a little more generality, perhaps, and we may be able to get some clues to uh, what's likely to happen in the future as these systems change. Um, I think the last thing I'll say before we get going is that it's very tempting to slip into calling this... Uh, a study of uh, optimal fertility. Uh, it's really not, although I may occasionally use those words, if we were seriously trying to uh, ask what an optimal level of fertility would be, we'd have to start with what people, what fertility people want and what their changes in satisfaction and happiness and so on would be with a slightly higher or slightly lower fertility. But we're abstracting completely from that. We're just looking at the way that fertility leads to population age distributions and they interact with the support uh, systems. Um, and the other thing we're not looking at is the eventual, uh, the effect, eventual effects of variations in fertility levels on future population sizes, which will have environmental impacts and political and military and cultural impacts and so on. We're not looking at that either. So this is a limited study, but we are going to, if we have time, come in the end to taking into account the fact that there's capital in these economies and that uh, higher fertility leads to more rapidly before growth and requires then higher savings rates and more investment in order to maintain uh, a given level of uh, capital for workers. Okay, so let's start by uh, I'll say a word about this National Transfer Accounts Project. Um, it is a collection of new methods uh, we use to estimate economic relations among ages and generations, economic flows. It's done in a way that is consistent with standard national accounts as developed by the United Nations in SNA, their system of national accounts. But it extends these by including uh, public and private transfers, um, and by breaking everything down by age. And it's an exhaustive um, decomposition of the things that are covered in standard national accounts. Um, that doesn't mean it covers everything, because there are a lot of things that aren't covered in those standard accounts. And I should say, going forward, we're adding the dimension of time use, and uh, currently these things are not by sex, they're by uh, sort of an average, and we're looking at them by sex in the future as well. Huh? Yeah. What about transfers through the market? I'm thinking of... Saving, savings, you're saving, savings, yeah, those are in there as well. Bank, and then you... Yeah, okay. yeah. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's your employer-provided pension plan. Some countries it might be a government uh, pension plan that's funded. Those kinds of things are also included. So we have a book that just came out last fall. Um, in, in, in truth, it has something like, uh, I don't know, probably 75 or 80 authors, but uh, Andy and I are, <laughs> uh, we're sort of lead authors 
authors uh, <laughs> and editors. Uh, <laughs> at all, yeah. And um, you can buy this book uh, for 200 bucks, uh, but you can also download it free on the web, <laughs> courtesy of um, IDRC, a Canadian foundation having bought up the electronic rights that, that also support some of the research. So if you go to this web address, you should be able to find out how to download it, either as a PDF or as an ebook. Okay, and this is the geographic coverage, which isn't completely up to date, because now, um, wherever Turkey is, somewhere, <laughs> I've lost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess this is Turkey, yeah. No, you don't. No? no. 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 Okay. My problem is I can't tell where the water is there. Okay. The water is And um, Egypt is going to be joining shortly, and there are other countries uh, that will be coming on. These are the countries that are now we're now 37, um, and this was our last meeting uh, in Belo Horizonte um, in December, and if you look carefully, you would see a lot of people you know, like uh, Miguel Santos Romero, and Carol is here somewhere. Uh, I, I identified her last night, and Andy and I, and... Uh, Eduardo Neto from the old days, and Bernardo is here. There's Bernardo, I think, and uh, Piedad is here somewhere. Uh, there she is, and uh, and Tim is right behind. Is that yeah. Tim? Yeah. Uh, so there are lots of people that you know, and Yvonne is here. Uh, okay. Anyway. So, yeah. uh, okay. So the starting point is that we estimate uh, cross-sectional pro profiles of labor income and consumption, and I'm going to be using those a lot in uh, today in this talk. And they are population averages at each age. So they're averaged across males and females. Uh, when we're doing labor income, it's averaged across people who have zero labor income at a given age, and so on. It's an average. Um, and then these age profiles, which are derived from existing data sets, after a lot of work. This is a huge amount of work for any given country. And each country has its own team, and it takes the teams a lot of work. And uh, yeah, OK. So then the age profiles are adjusted to match the totals in national income accounts for a given population age distribution. And then we standardize, uh, we'll be doing this throughout by dividing, for each country, we divide the age profiles by average labor income, ages 30 to 49, uh, post-school before retirement is the idea there. So consumption includes uh, private expenditures within the household that are imputed to individuals and public in-kind transfers like public education, publicly provided health care, long-term care, but not public pensions because that's just money and you could give it away or save it or whatever. It's not consumption. Um, <clears throat> for private expenditures within the household, we are able to look at health and education by age in one way or another. And then the rest of consumption, the other, is allocated to uh, individuals in the household in proportion to assumed equivalent adult consumer weights, which are the same across all countries. 0.4 of an adult for ages 0 to 4, and then rising linearly to 1 at age 20. Um, and then once we've done this calculation for uh, each individual in each household, then we average across all individuals in the whole country, and similarly for labor income. And then by comparing labor income of someone in a household to the consumption we impute in this way, we can also uh, infer what transfers uh, are, public transfers and private transfers. Private transfers, public transfers we have direct information. 
Excuse me, Ron. Yeah. Does it matter that you know some things can't be disaggregated, like defense spending is a big chunk of GDP, but isn't consumed by yeah. large groups? Yeah. Uh, well, we'll see in a moment that things that cannot be allocated are assumed to just be proportional capita okay. across the whole age distribution. Um, NIH funding, uh, <laughs> the United Nations diplomatic uh, you know, mission from the U.S., uh, our public, local library, uh, these kinds of things, police, fire, we can't allocate in there, just uh, per uh, Okay, so this is what they look like. So there are 22 of the 37 or so that we now have. You can see there's a lot of variation in level of consumption. Remember, this is relative to labor income, age 30 to 49. A lot of variation in, in levels of consumption. Quite a bit of variation in um, the age pattern of labor income. But uh, so to try to extract some signal from this noise, um, let's look at the age profiles for the richest quartile and for the poorest quartile uh, out of those countries. And here the poor countries are in blue and the rich countries are in red. And um, not as much difference in labor income at young ages as you might expect. And that's partly because uh, Nigeria has very low um, labor income for young people. There's high youth unemployment, and they don't really get going to their 20s. We'll look at that in a moment. I don't recall Kenya, but it may be affecting it also. In any event, a higher um, youth labor income. But the big, the big characteristic features here to look at in contrast are high human capital spending in the rich industrial countries relative to the poor countries, uh, flat consumption in the poor countries relative to uh, very strongly increasing in the rich countries. Consumption includes health care? That includes health care, long-term care. And we'll see a little more detail on that in a moment. And then you see in the rich countries, okay, they keep working or they have high labor income a bit longer, perhaps because their work is more cerebral, less wrong, but then, boom, they just stop working uh, and have very low uh, labor income at older ages compared to in the poor countries. So those are the main features of interest here. Now I want to contrast uh, a couple of uh, countries for primarily labor income here. This is Austria and Nigeria. Now you might think Nigeria would be the one who would have early uh, labor income, but no. Austria stands out in the whole set of countries as having very early start and, and steep increase the labor income by age. That's reflecting a peculiar a peculiarity of the Austrian system, which is a heavy reliance on apprenticeships rather than formal uh, education. So uh, you see this unusual pattern. They start very, very young. And there's a little bit of that in Germany and maybe some other places, not nearly as strong as in Austria. And then a very early departure from uh, the labor force and quite complete departure. But they're not the first to depart. I think Slovenia has the earliest. Uh, um, well, I think this is Slovenia here. But Austria is one of the earlier ones. And then you compare that to Nigeria with a very late start and a very late finish. Um, so the fact that the Nigerian are working later, uh, their consumption is pretty flat uh, with age, is going to mean that old age is relatively cheap in Nigeria, but childhood is relatively expensive. And so uh, we might expect that uh, a lower level of fertility is going to be uh, maximizing support ratios in Nigeria than in Austria. And we'll see if that's the case. And then here is a look at consumption. So this is comparing Sweden and Spain. This one with the rapid increase at older ages is Sweden. Um, and that's health care, long-term care, things like that. Um, Spain, well, in fact, what happens in Spain is that their private consumption really dips 
in old age for whatever reason. Um, and they also have pretty high and, and, and fairly rapidly increasing uh, health expenditures uh, in old age, but you combine that with the falling private consumption and you get this sort of flat profile that looks like Nigeria or most of our uh, poor country profiles. So again, uh, old age is going to be a lot more expensive in Sweden than in Spain. Okay, now here is the US. Uh, some of you have seen this before. Um, this is the age profile of consumption in 1960, 1981, and 2007, just before the crisis. We can come up to 2009 or 2010, but I uh, think it's more interesting to look pre-crisis. Um, and here is the gray at the bottom is what Mike was asking about. That's public other. You can see it's not a big uh, component of total consumption. Um, and then I guess the things I uh, point out here are the purple is human capital investment. That's public spending on education. Um, this little blue here is private spending on education. And you see how the public spending on education has grown over the time, over time relative to labor income. Uh, but the big story here is how this brown layer, which is public spending on health care, uh, which 1960 was before Medicare, before Medicaid, was very small. You see how it has expanded so dramatically by 1981 and expanded even further by 2007. Uh, you also see that that's not the whole story about rising role of uh, expenditures for health. This is private expenditures, which used to be uh, well, relatively small, and then you see how private expenditures have grown, grown particularly at older ages, and uh, continuing in 2007. And here you have the sharp drop in private expenditure corresponding to age 65 when people become eligible for Medicare. Um, okay, in any event, you see the changing shape. This is even, you know, in third world countries, you don't have this fall off in old age. I think that's because we had. Even in 1960, we had relatively low co-residents of, yeah? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Um, I was just wondering, is this controlling for differences in each composition between these plans? This is per, per, capita? per capita, okay. yeah. So this is not weighted by the population age distribution. And I'm not going to show you any that are weighted, but of course that's very interesting also because in the industrial countries you have a huge weight and the, relatively speaking, at the older ages of the third world countries, it's just a tiny sliver of resources being reallocated to the elders. Um, okay, and then this is the last I'm going to show you on these profiles. Um, this is the U.S. in 2003. It looks a little different than in 2007. Uh, this is the Philippines. And if we look down here, we have the public uh, transfers, we call them inflows, these are the public transfers received in the U.S. by age. This would be long-term care. And these are the public transfers made, those would be tax payments. Um, and so you see uh, heavy uh, net public transfers received by children, and also public heavy net public transfers received by the elderly, whereas the prime working age uh, ages are paying net, net taxes. You compare this to the Philippines, and you see, first of all, the scale is, is the same, so these are comparable. You see how much smaller the public sector is in the Philippines, and you see that in old age, uh, taxes are about equal to uh, benefits received. That's about what it looks like, like in California, too, for that matter. States which don't have big pension programs and, uh, and uh, Medicare and so on. Uh, but, so, you can see here that aging is going to be very expensive in the U.S. and not so expensive for the public sector. Uh, maybe, in fact, it would be cost-saving in some sense in the Philippines. And then these are private transfers. I'm not going to be using, going to be doing anything with the private transfers, but you can see how much more important the private transfers are in the Philippines. Again, the scales are the same. Uh, so, you can compare these and they're much, much more important in the Philippines than in the U.S. And in the U.S., you can see that private transfers made, that is, these outflows, are greater than private transfers received, 
all through adulthood, including in old age. Elderly people are on net making transfers, private transfers to their kids, whereas in uh, the Philippines after, I don't know exactly what this age is, maybe 70 or so, maybe a little bit older, you see that the elderly are receiving net private transfers uh, in excess of what they're making. Okay, so that's uh, by way of background, and uh, yes, it really is that time. Okay, so I'll just uh, speed through this to say, okay, we're going to be looking at support ratios. We imagine a coefficient beta that shifts the consumption age profile up or down depending on the resources available to pay for uh, the consumption. And so here we have the population in some year times the age profile of consumption in a base year that is held fixed. And here we have the age distribution in some year times the labor income in that same base year that's held fixed. And as the, in the base year, these two integrals should be equal uh, under the simple, in this simple economy rules, which I'm not going to go into since there's not much time now, but basically we're simulation of capital. Um, and so when the age distribution becomes more favorable, beta can rise above one, and when it's less favorable, beta drops below one. And we're going to be looking for the level of fertility that gives a population growth rate that corresponds to a stable population age distribution that gives us the largest possible value of beta. That's what we're going to be doing. And, um, okay, so let's look at a couple of, at some examples over time in the non-stable case. So these are support ratios for Costa Rica based on Costa Rican uh, parameters. And so this is the period, Costa Rica is still in a, in, in a time frame, in a stage of the transition in which um, the population age distribution is becoming more favorable, the support ratio is rising, uh, but uh, in 20 years or so, that situation will change, the population will age, and we'll be heading here towards perhaps, of course we don't know what's going to happen, but perhaps towards a stable population age distribution in the post-transition period. Um, and so the interest here is, okay, what level of fertility will give the most beneficial support ratio in this stable, uh, stable circumstances, stable population circumstances? So here are some other countries. I think I'll just skip over those. This is perhaps of more interest. This is uh, some developed countries. Here's the United States, for example. Uh, so a very non-classic transition because we have the baby boom, baby bust, uh, and then the UN is projecting a lot of convergence. But if we look out to 2050, well, this is the decline in the support ratio that results from population aging as the baby boom retires. Um, it's not huge. There's something like a, maybe a 10 or 12 percent uh, decline in the support ratio as the population ages. And then, let's see, do I have, yeah, so this boils down to about 0.3 percent per year in terms of consumption due to the deteriorating support ratio. Uh, Germany, about two-thirds of a percent per year. Japan, two-thirds. Spain, a bigger drop here, closer to 1% per year uh, as the population ages. And then here we'd be entering into the stable, something more like a stable population range. Okay, so is post-transition fertility too low? We've seen these big fluctuations in age distribution, and what we're going to be looking at is, as, as I said, the sort of thing after all that has happened, um, populations will continue to age due to continuing mortality decline, we expect, but if fertility stabilizes, then they reach what used to be called a quasi-stable population age distribution. It's close to a stable uh, population age distribution. Okay. Um, 
we can, let's just skip over this. Okay, so we can um, find numerically, or there's some analytic work we can do, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, we can find what total fertility rate would maximize the support ratio for each of these countries. And that's what this column, the red column, does. And, well, you can see, first off, that the median fertility that maximizes the support ratio is very close to replacement. Um, but there's some countries that are different. So our, our friends Nigeria and Austria, let's look at them. Nigeria, if you remember, old age is relatively inexpensive there because people work deep into old age and they don't consume that much. And, and children are very expensive because they don't work. And so what works for Nigeria is uh, a, a very low level of fertility. And if we look at Austria, what works for Austria is a very high level of fertility. Not extremely high, but, but high. So that's so the outcome here depends uh, on those actual age profiles and their regional differences and, and, and so on. There are other countries, something like Nigeria, these South, uh, Southeast Asian countries, have, people work a long time, they have very uh, meager public sector transfer programs, and uh, so you see these low levels of fertility that are optimal. If we look at the European countries, well, Austria, I already mentioned, Germany, something like Austria, but generally these are right at uh, replacement level. The U.S. is at 2.2. Um, okay. Now, another interesting thing to look at is, so we have the current total fertility rate down here. Um, the intrinsic support ratio is the support ratio that would result from the stable population if this fertility remained constant. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of the implication of the current level of fertility. And then uh, here we have the support ratio that results from this maximizing fertility level. And then here is simple replacement level. And well, Look at Aust Austria, for example. Um, its maximizing fertility level was 2.6. Um, but there's virtually no difference between the support, there's hardly any difference between the support ratio you get from a TFR of 2.6 and the TFR you get from uh, replacement level. So this is a very flat. So you're coming out in favor of replacement fertility. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet, Carl. No, no that's not the bottom line. <laughs> Could be, um, but uh, yeah. So um, we look at Nigeria. Well, okay. There's maybe there's a bigger difference between the support ratio with 1.3 and the replacement level. But in general, if you look at China, there's no discernible difference to two decimal places in the support ratio as you move across uh, this fertility range. So. Uh, if this is our criterion, in most cases, uh, it just doesn't make that much difference once you get to steady state. It may make a lot of difference in the trans transitional stages, which, as we saw back there, can be, uh, you know, these, there's a lot of action there. Okay. Ron, um, so these are for uh, the current population age distribution? Age profiles of consumption and income, or they're for the current age profiles of consumption and labor income. So, like 2010 or something like that. Uh, no, well, I say current. What I mean is the base year for the NTA estimates, which I don't think they're as late as 2010 for any of the countries here. But they would mostly be between 1994 and 2009, I think, something like that. Ah. Most of them are in the 2000s. So this makes no assumption. the support ratio? It is the ratio. Um, if you calculate, suppose you go back to those uh, labor income profile, consumption profile. You take some population age distribution, and you multiply it times the labor income age profile, and you get some mass of labor income result, a single number, you uh -huh. add it up. And you do the same for consumption. 
The support ratio is the ratio of that mass of labor income to the mass of consumption. So it's a like a dependency ratio, except it's inverted. And instead of being you know, zeros and ones, it's actual. It's less than one because uh, the, some of the money is coming from somewhere else. Yeah, right? well, m money comes from asset income. It comes from borrowing. If you're in the United States, you borrow <laughs> internationally and all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some of them are going to get repaid at some point. So <laughs> yeah. OK, so this, is, so this is the overall support ratio. If we just looked at this, we might come out pretty much where Carl Mason <laughs> said. And I should say, we're not the only ones who've done this. And we had a brown bag about 15 years ago from Jang Lin, who did something like this, except using not using these data. And, uh, and Tolja was doing some things along this, and David Weil at Brown has done some stuff using our data. Uh, so it's not like no one has uh, thought of this before, no one has that impression. Okay, now this is using the general support ratio, but I would say the changes in the support ratio with fertility are not particularly dramatic. I think there, there's an, people have an exaggerated notion of how much difference it makes, uh, fertility banks or the change in population age distribution makes in that context. But what does matter is if you look at where the consequences are more narrowly focused, which tends to be in the public sector, the pensions and the publicly provided health care and so on. So we can do something similar using uh, the kind of thing I showed you for the United States and Philippines earlier, where instead of having labor income, you have tax payments by age, and instead of having consumption, you have government benefits received by age. So you can calculate what uh, might be called a fiscal support ratio, um, and then you can ask, well, what total fertility rate would maximize the fiscal support ratio? Okay. So uh, before we look at that, let's look at the age pattern of public transfers uh, in different countries. This is a slide from Tim Miller, chapter seven, uh, one of the comparative chapters in this book. This is a comparative study of uh, public transfers. And here we have um, public transfers to the elderly this is relative to labor income age 30 to 49. And here are public transfers to children. Uh, and this is, these are per capita. So this is per elderly person, and this is per child. And so if we were on a 45 degree line here, which I guess would go something like that, that would be equal transfers per child and per elderly person. But in fact, this slopes more in favor of tra public transfers to the elderly. And this is the, um, I think the median, or maybe it's the mean the intersection of these lines. I think these are the medians across there. Now, uh, there are interesting regional patterns here. Latin America tends to have uh, low expenditures on kids relative to the elderly. Brazil is the world champion by a very long shot. Um, they have very generous public pensions and not that generous public education and so on. But uh, Chile, Costa Rica are in that box as well. Uruguay and Mexico are sort of in that direction, but they're in uh, this lower box that has a bunch of East Asian uh, and South Asian countries, so we have China, Korea, Thailand, Philippines, um, India. Um, where is, why is it Indonesia here? I'm not sure. I wonder if that's an unlabeled point for some country. Anyway, um, and then we have US and Taiwan is actually more generous per child than for elderly uh, in comparative context. But US, Taiwan, and Spain are up here. Uh, and then most of Western Europe is up here. Japan, um, 
with high transfers both for kids and for the elderly. Japan is favoring within this group uh, children. Austria is favoring the elderly. Sweden is uh, perhaps slightly favoring the elderly. This is Germany. Okay, so that will give us some insight as we come to the next table, which is looking at what level of fertility maximizes um, the, the fiscal support ratio. And right off, you see, instead of being 2.0, now it's 2.6. Um, and that's because the public sector, at least in the richer countries, um, is transferring a lot of resources to help them. But now, again, let's uh, see. Now, unfortunately, um, Kenya and Nigeria are not on this, uh, this table. And also, I'm not sure. This is a, a pasted-in picture rather than a live table, and I wasn't able to correct uh, a bunch of these fertility rates that aren't correct. <laughs> so some of these are wrong. But that doesn't affect this, uh, this column and this calculation. So, what do we find here? Well, this is the champion I pointed out a moment ago, Brazil, with generous to, children, to elderly, per elder, relatively stingy to kids, has very high uh, support rate, fiscal support ratio maximizing fertility. And you get, you know, the difference, difference between this support ratio and this one is something like a 40% difference in the level of consumption. So that's non-trivial, uh, even relative to the replacement level support ratio. This is not uh, trivial. So, um, and generally in Latin America, <coughs> with these generous transfer programs for the elderly, you see these high uh, levels of, of, of fertility above the median 2.6. And uh, then here we have the European countries. Now Austria, with that early retirement and early entry to the labor force, has a very high um, uh, fiscal support ratio maximizing level. Germany, a little bit less so. Um, Sweden, remember it was, uh, you know, tended to be in this towards uh, favoring the elderly as well. Um, it's fairly high. Uh, the US is right around replacement level. Um, can't, what else can I point to here? Uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia is interesting here because you can see they're very low and uh, we can expect that Nigeria would look something like this uh, as well because um, they don't do much for the elderly and they do more for the children and so the public sector does better with, so we saw the Philippines, the on net, they're doing nothing for the elderly in the public sector, but they are making, you know, their public education and so on for kids. So they're better off with low fertility, and um, that's true of most of these countries. India is right in that place. Okay, so that's the next point. That's the first point of disagreement with Dr. Mason's <laughs> <laughs> proposal. Um, and here's a regional summary, and incidentally, those were using um, own countries' mortality as well as fertility, and we might wonder, well, how much of that is due to differences in mortality between the countries? So uh, this is, first of all, summarizing by region. So we see that South and Southeast Asia has this very low average maximizing fertility. Latin America has a very high one. Those are the two outliers. But uh, here we see the same calculations, but all done assuming Japan's survival schedule, so much longer life, particularly for poor countries. And it doesn't change the basic picture. We still have South and Southeast Asia, uh, low fertility in Latin America, high fertility, and the rest in between. Now, um, I want to move to including um, capital, which can be done in the same sort of analytic framework. Um, because if you choose higher fertility, then you have a higher growth rate of the population and higher growth rate of the labor force. 
And that means you have to save and invest more, and that reduces consumption and so on. And the more capital you have per worker, the bigger this effect of more rapid uh, growth is. So there's a nice result um, from Arthur and McNichol back in 1978 in a comment on a very interesting paper by Samuelson, by Paul Samuelson on optimal population growth rates, uh, in which Samuelson made a famous error of not checking his second order conditions and he had found the welfare minimum rather than the welfare maximum in his, uh, his paper and there were um, comments, uh, uh, particularly Alan Deerdorf was the one who first pointed this out. But uh, this was another comment which was probably more, certainly I'd say more interesting than the original Samuelson paper or than Deerdorf's. Uh, <laughs> comment, and um, so this is looking at the effect of a, a little bump up in the population growth rate, and this part of it is just what we would have gotten when we were looking earlier at uh, what maximizes the support ratio. This is the same uh, first order condition. <coughs> the, the average age of consumption uh, should equal the average age of labor income at the maximum, and the, if the average age consumption is greater as it is in aging Western countries, then you want higher fertility and higher growth rate. If uh, average age of consumption is lower than the average age of earning, then transfers you downward and you want lower fertility and so on. I, I didn't go into all that, I skipped over it. But in the fuller result that includes uh, capital, then we have this. Um, this is comparing golden rule steady state, so it's not perfectly general by any means. But the point here is that this is the capital consumption ratio, and so economies with more capital are going to have a bigger ratio here. And this is the effect that if you have a higher fertility and higher N, you've got to equip the workers with more capital, you've got to save more, and so on. So this works in the opposite direction to this in rich industrial countries, and you need to have uh, the average age of consumption greater than the average age of labor income in order to offset this capital dilution effect. And uh, so we expect that uh, fertility, the maximizing level of fertility, is going to be lower in this case. So um, this is the result here. If we take Sort of what is a typical capital labor ratio um, in rich industrial countries and hold it constant while we vary fertility and take into account the cost of holding it constant by saving more and investing more and so on. Then we find now a median maximizing level of fertility that takes into account both the support ratio and the costs of more rapid growth in terms of or the advantages of of population decline in terms of needing uh, lower savings rates. So now we get a median of 1.5. So this is taking, this is the uh, capital labor ratio was given and just optimizing or maximizing on fertility. Uh, and here we try looking for the so-called uh, goldenest golden rule, which was a term that came out of Samuelson's original uh, this article I just mentioned, and in which you try to maximize, there's Bernardo right there. Uh, you try to maximize both uh, fertility and the capital intensity and the capital labor ratio. So you're, you're maximizing in two dimensions, and you choose, if fertility is lower, then you would choose a higher capital labor ratio. If the capital labor ratio is higher, you would choose lower fertility. And so there needn't be uh, a solution that maximizes, an interior solution that maximizes both of these at the same time. But for these countries, there is. And if you look at the median there, it's even lower than in this case. So um, what do we conclude from this? Well, uh, I mentioned the limitations. I, I won't go over them again. but. Um, 
there's a suggestion here that um, rich industrial nations maybe are overly concerned with their, uh, their low fertility, uh, if you look at it in a broader context. If you just focus on what, what helps the, the fiscal health of the uh, public sector, then you're you know, pushed in the direction of wanting fertility to be higher and so on. If you take a broader look at the whole network of these intergenerational relations, both the public sector, but more important, uh, perhaps the private sector as well, and you take into account the saving and dissaving and so on, then uh, fertility below replacement begins to look more appealing. Now, what about the fact that these uh, age profiles are going to change, that the labor income we expect is going to, uh, that right tail is going to drift upwards. People are going to work longer and retire later and so on. Well, you might say that's going to push us in the direction of Nigeria, um, which favors lower fertility rather than higher fertility. But the other side of this is the rising health care costs. And if those continue to go up, as who knows what's going to happen in the U.S., for example. Supposedly, the, uh, the Health Care Reform Act has put uh, mechanisms in place to make uh, health care costs per enrollee not rise faster than per capita income or something like that. That would pretty much take care of this if that really happened. But if those health care costs keep drifting up faster than per capita income growth or, or productivity growth, then the consumption side of the age profile uh, you know, begins to look worse and worse, and, and then uh, there would be, that would suggest moving towards higher, higher fertility. Okay, let me just end. So these are, this is just a quick overview of those different levels, but um, let me just end by saying if we go back to that UN survey on which countries think their fertility is too high and which are think they're too low. Um, okay, there are 22 cases in, in the UN data. In 18 out of those, uh, this optimal fertility calculation, or maximizing support ratio, or whatever, in, this, in the, the simple one, the first one I did, predicts national policy in 18 out of the 22 cases um, in this sense, that if actual fertility is more than 0.2 above optimal, then they have policies in place to reduce fertility. I'm not talking here about attitudes, but actual pronatalist policies. Um, if fertility is within 0.2 of optimal, then uh, seven of the eight countries have no policies to change fertility. And six of the nine countries with actual, actual fertility less than 0.2 below optimal do have policies. And then I finally have to say, <laughs> this does I think it gets two more countries right than just using replacement levels. Instead of the <laughs> okay. That's, that's it. Well, so, so, so Mark, <laughs> you, 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 you used each of those countries as being a closed economy? Yes, these are closed economies. So if, if capital flows between countries, um, does, does it really change things much? Well, let's see, do you, if, I mean, since this is looking at steady states, I guess it would depend on whether you think that you could permanently run in a, uh, a you know, a negative uh, in the international capital flow account or something like that. Well, it, just, it occurred to me that, that then, then capital would be dependent on the world population uh, yeah, ratios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then given that it doesn't right. matter much, it doesn't seem like it would change things much at all yeah. to have. No, I think that, I think you're, Right, it's that um, the right way to look at this is in terms of global capital markets and and then if we think of the countries as relatively small countries that have to take, then countries are taking their return to capital and their wage rates as given for the international economy and so on, and then we look at uh, say the rich countries as a whole, and compare them to poor countries as a whole, and we can study resource flows and so on. And so there have been detailed macro simulations done along those lines, for example, by uh, Axel Borch-Supens, 
uh, team in Mannheim now at the Max Planck Institute. And uh, I think he, he chops the world up into two or three regions like that and looks at these flows. And um, how much difference would that make here? I guess it wouldn't affect the first story, just the support ratio story, but it would affect this last one in which you're taking capital, uh, capital labor ratios into account. I mean, yes, what happens in the U.S. isn't going to have a big effect on those capital labor ratios. They will be set by international investors. On the other hand, what happens in the U.S. will determine how much asset income there is uh, in addition to the labor income. There's a lot or a little. It will depend on whether we're on net exporting capital or importing A roof. Um, this is fascinating on the fertility side, but what it doesn't seem to address at all is the essential problem even in the wealthy countries, which is most cannot make productive use of their working age population now. So the idea that raising the birth rate is going to somehow improve the, the income flows seems a, a little... Um, sort of upside down thinking when you have high levels of unemployment, high levels of unemployment, people who are out of the labor force even though they like to be in it, people who are basically unemployable. You see that in the United States. So um, when we talk about keeping people longer in the labor force, of course then that flies in the face of the need to open up opportunities for younger people to go into the labor force. So. I'm just wondering um, how that all fits into this thinking. You're sort of taking these um, income and consumption as sort of given and showing the implications of yeah. fertility for that. But those are all different stories, right? And they're all amenable to different kind of yeah. policy well, issues. Well, uh, the, the second part of, of your point was about increasing labor supply at older ages and whether that would you know, make worse the problem mm -hmm. of um, uh, young people looking younger. for jobs and so on. So there's been a, I mean, that's a common view in Europe. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Not. economists are very dismissive of that mm -hmm. view, and there's a recent study by Ruber and Wise, who had a, a series of international comparative studies that addresses exactly this issue and uh, they conclude no if anything um, having more older people working perhaps has a slight positive for yeah. employment mm -hmm. for the young yeah. and they look at that's based on partly looking at their work on uh, the structure of retirement systems because a lot of European systems have incentives to get older people out of the labor force because they thought that would yeah. make room for yeah. younger people. Yeah. So they can use those as, a, as an instrument. No, it didn't. Yeah. It doesn't work. Uh -huh. And they look at some specific programs, like in Denmark, there was you know, a one-time adjustment that was mm -hmm. supposed to make room, and yeah. it had the opposite okay. uh, effect. I'm not sure about the French moving to the 35 hour. I don't remember. But I think you know, the basic idea is that someone who works is consuming out of the income and uh, you know they're generating demand, more demand for output by virtue of working and creating that income. And uh, if we look at the second half of the 20th century, we see this enormous increase in female labor supply, for example, in the U.S., which didn't displace male workers. And so th those are the kinds of uh, yeah. arguments. The first part is harder to answer, I think think. Uh, we have to imagine we're not in a crisis situation. If we're in a crisis situation, then yeah. But but uh, this is yeah. steady. This is long term. Okay. So uh, let's hope we're not going to be in a crisis situation and there will be jobs for young people. <laughs> let's see. That, that's the, uh, what was it? Want and hope? Wish and hope? What was it we had last week? <laughs> There were, uh, yeah. Richard. Uh, I'm a little uncertain about how you treat trans private transfers when people die. Uh, we don't know very much about ah, who gets the bequests money. are not in here. Oh, that's 
could be a big. Yeah, it's a big uh, factor that we just don't yet have. I was about except to, for a couple of countries. I was about to suggest that the implication of your work is that you could help the fiscal side of things by taxing inheritances at very high rates. Because then that money goes back into the uh, fisc and it helps the uh, and helps the government budget. Yeah. Um, so incorporating. Uh, information on bequest flows is one of the next things on our agenda, and uh, I think it is uh, very important. I think it's a big, uh, a big missing actor in this story because I think a lot of what the public pension systems have done is to enable elderly people to save their assets and consume out of their public pensions, and uh, they're going to be the big bequests when they when they die. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, that this, this analysis predicts the pronatalist policies. Do not don't the pronatalist policies also raise the costs, raise public costs of young people, and thus in this analysis are counterproductive? Um, I guess you could ask how much how much might you want to pay mm -hmm. <laughs> couples to have another kid. Yeah. And but in doing that. You, you raise that cost, so you, you, you so then you pay somewhat less. I, I, I don't know. You're right. You'd have to do some further so it, calculation. So while this may predict the policies, it also predicts that they're not reading this paper. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have to imagine that the policy consists of saying in the newspaper, "Please have two and a half days. <laughs> Please do something." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the United States replacement uh, of this desirable base was 2.12, as I recall. Uh, so that was under one, yeah, it's right around there, and they're all what, what, happens, what happens if the uh, Obama health care uh, program actually goes through? Is that going to raise that rate, that uh, number? Um, well, if if the health care plan, I'm not sure whether you mean the contraception side of what Obama's been no, talking no, about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> everybody having to have health care. Yeah, well, a part of the Obama health care reforms is cost containment for Medicare. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, then this leaves this analysis intact. Okay. If it doesn't contain costs, and I don't think most people expect that it will, uh -huh. then the situation changes in a direction which is going to be more favorable towards higher fertility. Okay. Cam. So this analysis, as you explained at the beginning, um, is invariant to size. Yeah. It's entirely on the basis of ratios, and so if one doubles the population of India or quadruples it, then this analysis one still has the same uh, outcomes. And but there is some work, I guess Emilio on the airplane sort playing around, in which one looks at the characteristics of consumption profiles in terms of resource requirements. And so we try to see you know, sort of the sustainable economy calculations that people do, what age structures, the implications of age structures for uh, resource depletion, or things of this sort. So I was wondering, as we saw the Arthur McNichol piece on um, K over C ratios, is there analytic work going forward which would allow a size term to be factored into any of these calculations? Well, Emilio's also depends on ratios, I guess, since it's basically that age distribution of household heads or something like that. Um, Work on size would be work being done by environmentalists and people like, is it Mike O'Brien, is that his name? Uh, there, there's, a whole, there's a whole network on the web, PERN, a uh, very active group. Um, I would say, yes, they're looking at scale but effects. Something of that kind be folded back. Into this. Into this kind of calculation. 
because in the stable state, your, your graphs go out to 20, 90 or something. Yeah. And so these different fertility rates in uh, places like Nigeria or some of the other places have very big differences in size factors. Yeah. Um, I'm just as a technical you know, question, it seems to be interesting to think how one would go about incorporating uh, somehow some kind of uh, cost to resource scarcity. Yeah. Just, I, I, I'm not sh really sure how to do that. Now, I have tried um, taking natural resources as part of what gets transferred in the sense that there's some national stock of resources uh, which you might think of loosely as being owned by the population. And in early work I did with Barney Cohen and Tim Miller, we tried to take that into account. And for some for Saudi Arabia or maybe for Alaska, it would make quite a bit of difference for uh, for the U.S. and uh, yeah, I don't I don't remember the uh, details of that, but I think that's not really what you're getting at. You're getting at something that has more to do with the population impact on the global environment, and uh, I'm not sure how to do that, but I certainly agree it's a very important factor. Of course, if people took these kinds of calculations seriously, then population is going to grow less rapidly and fertility would be lower, and, unless it's governments trying to maximize their public sector finances, which might be the way at all. Um, probably we should... <laughs>